Hello everyone. If you are new to OpenShot and video editing, and are looking for a tutorial that can help you get started quickly, then you've come to the right place. In this tutorial, I'm gonna first walk you through the OpenShot's user interface, menus, built-in effects, and most importantly, the powerful OpenShot clip properties. And then I'm gonna show you how to do video editing from the ground up through a complete step-by-step -step video editing exercise. By the end of this tutorial, you should be able to start your own video editing project with ease. All right, for this tutorial, I'm using OpenShot 3.1.1, which is the latest version as of September 2023. So when you start OpenShot for the first time, you should see a simple user interface layout like this one. At the very top of the window, you'll have a menu bar with five parent menu items. The file menu item contains submenus for managing the project's files and profile. The edit menu item has four submenu items, where the first two are for undoing and redoing the last action, while the last one is for setting your OpenShot's preferences or settings. The next one, the title menu item, is specifically provided for creating video title, where you can choose to create either a static text title or an animated title. While the view menu item contains some menus for arranging the user interface layout and showing or hiding the user interface elements, such as toolbar and panels. For quicker access, most of the frequently used submenu items have corresponding shortcut buttons on the toolbar. For example, this export video button is the shortcut button for the export video submenu item under the file parent menu item. Okay, now let's move on to the main window area. Right now my open shot is in so-called simple view layout, where the main window is loosely divided into three sections. The top left section by default hosts four docs or panels, the project files panel, the transitions, the effects, and the emojis panels. The project files panel is used for managing the media files of each project, such as the videos, audios, and the images that we've added to it. It has three built-in filters to show the videos only, the audios only, or the images only. These files can be shown either in details view or in thumbnail view. And if we right-click any of the media files and then click the file properties, OpenShot will show you the details information of that file, as well as its video and audio formats if applicable. Then, the Transitions panel lets you access the OpenShot's built-in transitions when you need to add smooth transitions between two successive clips or scenes. Similar to the Transitions panel, the Effects panel provides various built-in effects which you can easily add to your videos and audios in your project. For example, you can add brightness and contrast effect to your video to adjust its brightness and contrast to your preference. And lastly, the Emojis panel gives you access to many built-in emojis, should you wish to add some to your video. Okay, the next panel that I want to explain is the Timeline panel, which is perhaps the most important panel of all. This is where we do all the editing works, such as cutting and trimming, adding transitions, adding effects and animations, and so on. It visualizes your video project with all its clips, transitions, and effects. The Timeline consists of three parent UI elements a toolbar with a timeline zoom slider at the top, a timeline ruler, and a tracks panel. By default, OpenShot creates five tracks or layers on the timeline when you start a new project. You can easily add as many tracks as you need or remove the existing tracks if not needed. These tracks are universal track, meaning that you can add any type of media to each of them. You can even have medias of different types on the same track. This red vertical line is called the playback line or playhead. You can move the playhead left and right simply by clicking on the desired position on the timeline ruler or drag the playhead left or right. The times shown on the timeline ruler's markings have a standard format of hour, minute, and second, while the time shown on the left end of the ruler has one more component, which is the relative frame number of the frame at the current playhead position. For example, Right now the playhead is on the 10th frame of the 5th second of the timeline. Please take note that the maximum relative frame number shown here is the video frame rate set through the project profile, which I'll explain in the later part of this tutorial. For speed and convenience in editing, the timeline panel has several tools accessible from the timeline's toolbar. It also has many other tools which we can access from both the tracks and the clips context menus. 
I'll explain these context menus in more detail later as we do the exercise. And lastly, the top right panel is the video preview panel, which as its name implies, is where we play and preview the video we are editing on the timeline. When the playback is stopped, this panel shows the video frame at the current playhead position. In addition to these six panels, OpenShot has two more panels which are not shown in the simple view mode. They are the Properties Editor panel and the Captions panel. To show all the panels, click View on the menu bar, select Views and then click Show All. All these panels, except the Timeline panel, can be shown and hidden individually. For example, to hide the Captions panel, I can simply click the cross icon at the top right corner of the panel. To show a particular panel, click View on the menu bar, select Docs, and then click the panel you want to show. Besides showing and hiding each panel individually, we can also dock each panel to other location as we wish. For example, if I want the Properties panel to be in this tab group as another tab, I can simply click and drag it over to this tab group. Lastly, I'd like to mention that OpenShot has two modes of user interface layouts, Simple View and Advanced View. The Simple View is the UI layout I've been showing you so far in this tutorial. To switch to the Advanced View, click View on the menu bar, select Views and then click Advanced View. As you can see here, in the Advanced View mode, all panels are visible and positioned such that the whole layout gives you the most convenient access to all the medias, assets and tools while editing. This advanced view, however, would only be suitable on a screen size of at least 1920 by 1080. But then again, it's all up to you which one you're most comfortable with. Personally, I prefer the simple view, because I can have the timeline occupy the whole width of the window, and also I can have a larger video preview panel. Alright, the last thing that I want to talk about in this open shot overview is the clip properties. It is very critical that you gain a good understanding on the OpenShot's clip properties before you start doing any editing. To show the clip properties, right-click the clip and then click Properties. Or if the Properties Editor panel is already shown as a tab, simply click the clip and then show the panel. As you can see here, the clip has a number of properties which are shown in alphabetical order. Most of them are editable. Only some, such as duration and end, are not. Based on their value types, loosely speaking, there are two types of properties, numeric and non-numeric properties. To change the value of a numeric property, you can either click and drag its property value bar, or double-click its value bar and then type in the desired value. To change the value of a non-numeric property, right-click the property, and then select the desired value from its context menu. In addition to this value type classification, OpenShot also classifies the clip properties into keyframe properties and non-keyframe properties. Keyframe properties are animatable, meaning that their values can be interpolated over certain part of the video to create an animation effect on the video. To see if a property is a keyframe property, right-click that property. A keyframe property will have the Insert Keyframe option on its context menu, while a non-keyframe property won't. This keyframe properties concept will become clearer, as we do the exercise later. Now let me just quickly go through some of the most commonly used properties, so that you get an idea of what you can do with all those properties. The alpha property controls the transparency level of the video and image, and can be used to add fade effect. The enable audio can be used to turn on and off the audio component of the video. The frame number is used to show or hide the clip or the timeline frame number on the top left corner of the video preview panel. The location properties can be used to add sliding and panning effects to the video. The origin and rotation properties can be used to add rotation or spinning effect to the video. The scale property is useful when the raw video's dimension and aspect ratio do not match those of the project profile. For example, if I change the project profile to a vertical video profile, the current video clip will be shown on the screen like this. If I were to make this video fill the entire screen, I would have to set the scale property to either crop or stretch. The next important and commonly used properties are the scale X and scale Y properties. These properties can be used to add zoom effect to the video. And lastly, the volume property can be used to control the volume level of the audio component, such as to add fade effects to the audio.
Alright, now let's continue to the second part of this tutorial, which is a step-by-step -step guide on video editing from the ground up. So, the very first step of editing a video in OpenShot is to create and set up a new project. Simply click the new button on the toolbar, and OpenShot will create a new untitled empty project. And as you might have noticed, when you launch OpenShot from the Windows Start menu, it will also automatically create a new empty project for you. The next step is to add all the media files, such as the videos, sounds, and the images that we want to edit, to the project. To do that, you can click the Import Files button on the toolbar and then browse the desired media files. But the easier way to do it is to simply drag and drop the files from the Windows File Explorer to the OpenShots Project Files panel. Now if we right-click any one of the video files, and then click File Properties, OpenShot will show you the detailed information about that video. As you can see here, this video has a resolution or dimension of 1280 by 720, an aspect ratio of 16 by 9, and a frame rate of 24 frames per second. These properties will be useful for the next step, which is to set the project profile. The project profile is basically the settings of the desired output video, such as its resolution, aspect ratio, and its frame rate. Although OpenShot does not impose any rule on the project profile, ideally it should match those of the raw videos. Setting the project's resolution and frame rate higher than those of the raw videos may lead to an undesirable result. To change the project profile, click the Choose Profile button on the toolbar. On the Profile dialog, select the desired profile. Right now my project profile is set to HD 720p 30 frames per second and I want to change it to match those of the raw videos. So I will select the HD 720p 24 frames per second, and then click OK. Any change on the profile's resolution will be immediately reflected on the video preview panel, while any change on the frame rate will be reflected on the timeline's frame number. All right, so my new project is all set up and ready for editing. But let me first save this project to the desktop and call it demo. And then I will briefly show you how OpenShot manages each project's files. As you can see here, OpenShot creates a project file of type OSP and a project assets directory of the same base name. If I open this assets directory, we'll find four subdirectories in it. The Blender subdirectory will be used to store any animated title we create for this project using Blender through the animated title menu. Similarly, the title subdirectory will store all images of the titles or texts that we create using the static title menu. While the data and thumbnail subdirectory store the project's data and the raw video's thumbnails respectively. OpenShot does not make copies of the media files we add to the project. It only creates absolute references to those files. So make sure you don't move the media files around once you add them to an OpenShot project. Okay. Now let's edit these two videos, add some effects and animations to them, and then add an overlaying video title and a background music, to get something like this one. Alright, to create this video we'll only need three tracks on the timeline. So first, let's remove the two extra tracks so they don't become distractions. Then I'll drag the first video to track 2, as we'll use track 1 for the background music and track 3 for the overlaying video title. This is a 22 second video that looks and sounds like this. For any video clip that we add to the timeline, we can choose to show either its thumbnail or its audio waveform on the timeline. The audio waveform will be very useful when we have to work on the video based on its audio component. Now let's begin with the very basic step of video editing, which is to cut or trim off the unwanted parts. For this video, I want to trim off the first 3 seconds and the right half of it. To trim off the first 3 seconds, first move the playhead to the 3 seconds and 1 frame mark on the timeline ruler. For convenience in positioning the playhead accurately, Zoom in the timeline using the zoom slider until each second mark appears on the ruler. And then you can use the left and the right arrow keys on the keyboard to move the playhead left or right, one frame at a time. Then simply click and drag the left end of the clip and snap it onto the playhead. 
Another way of doing it is to right-click the clip, select Slice, and then click Keep Right Side. You can repeat the same steps to trim off some part at the end of the clip. If frame level accuracy is not required, you can use the razor tool to slice the clip into two, and then remove the unwanted portion using the Remove Clip tool on the context menu. To finish this trimming off step, let's completely remove the second half of the clip, which is from the 11 second and 1 frame mark onward. So I right click the clip, select Slice, and then click the Keep Left Side and now drag the clip to the start of the timeline. All right, the first effect that I want to add to this video is the fade in effect at the start of this clip. To do that, we'll use the preset fade in effect provided by OpenShot. So right click the clip, select fade, and then select start of the clip, and then click fade in fast. This will add a one second fade in effect to the start of the clip as shown here. Now if I drag the playhead slowly like this, you will see that the alpha properties value changed from 0 to 1 over the 1 second period at the start of the video. This is how the keyframe properties produce animation effects as I explained earlier. Now let's add a title to this video. So click title on the menu bar and then click title. On the titles dialog, we'll choose the gold one template from the template list. Then type in the file name of the title image file and then the desired video title. Click Change Font to change the text styles. As for the background color, since this title is going to overlay the video, I'll leave it transparent by leaving the alpha channel value 0. Click Save, and we should have an image file of type SVG containing the title text we set up just now. This image file is stored inside the title subfolder of the project's assets directory. Drag this title image file to track 3, and set its duration to 4 seconds by changing its end properties value to 4. Then we'll add a fade in and a fade out effect, to the start and to the end of this title clip respectively, using the preset fade effects. To do that, right click the title clip, select fade, and then select entire clip, and then click fade in and out fast. We'll also make this title clip start fading in 0.5 second into the video. So first move the playhead to the 0.5 second or 13th frame mark of the timeline. Make sure the snapping is enabled, and then drag the title clip to the left. It will automatically snaps onto the playhead. Now if we play the video, we should have something like this. Alright, now let's add the second video clip to track 2, and snap its start to the end of the first video clip. To add a smooth transition between the two clips, we'll use the built-in transitions provided by OpenShot. How smooth a transition will be depends on its duration. The longer the better, but too long is not good either. For this example, I'll make the transition last for 2 seconds. So first I'll move the playhead to the 6 seconds mark of the ruler. And then click and drag the second video clip to the left and snap it onto the playhead. OpenShot will automatically add a fade transition over the two clips overlap. To change the transition type, click the transition to show its properties. On the properties panel, right click the source property, select transition, and then select the desired transition. For this example, I'll select the luminous spiral 10. Now if we play the video, we would have something like this. Alright, the next thing we are going to do is to add zooming in and panning animation effects to the second video clip. In this part of the exercise, we're gonna put our understanding of keyframe properties into practice. So the first step of adding a zooming in animation is to determine the start point or frame of the animation. After that, we have to determine the properties whose values are to be interpolated to produce the desired animation. For this zooming in animation, We'll interpolate the scale x, scale y, location x, and location y properties. The reason why we also interpolate the location properties is because we want to zoom into any location on the video. Once we have all this in mind, right click each property and then click insert keyframe. This will make the current frame the start keyframe of the zooming in animation. The next step is to decide the end frame of the animation or the animation duration, whichever makes more sense to you. 
We also have to decide the final values of the keyframe properties for this end frame. These final values, together with the animation duration, will determine how smooth the animation will be, so make sure you get them right. For this example, I'll zoom in the video from a normal scale of 1, to a zoom factor of 2, over 1 and a half second. So I'll go to the properties panel and change the scale x and y values to 2. As for the location properties values, I'll set their final values by clicking and dragging the video preview until I get the desired zoom in location. To finish off this animation, I'll make it fast in the beginning and slower towards the end. To do that, we'll need to change the interpolation modes of the keyframe properties for the end keyframe. So right-click each property, select Bezier, and then click Ease Out. Now let's play the video to see the result. Alright, to add the panning effect after the zooming in animation, we can follow the same steps. But this time, we only need to interpolate the location X property over the desired panning animation duration. Then I will also repeat these steps to add a zooming out animation after the panning effect. But this time, the property's final values are set back to their initial values at the start of the earlier zooming in animation. Now let's play the video to see the result. Alright, to finish off the editing of the second video clip, I'll add one more animation to it, which is a shutter closing effect at the end of the clip. But this time I'm gonna use the built-in effect provided by OpenShot, so that you'll have a complete picture of how to add animations and effects to a video. So first I'll show the effects panel and then I will add a crop effect to the second video clip. An effect icon will appear at the top left corner of the clip. If we click this icon, the effect properties will be shown on the properties panel. If this icon is hidden by a transition, we can show the effect properties by clicking the selection drop-down menu at the top of the properties panel. To add a shutter closing effect using this crop effect, we basically follow the same steps as those of adding the zooming in animation. The only difference is that, the keyframe properties we're working on now, are the built-in effect properties. So move the playhead to the desired start frame of the shutter closing animation. Then insert that frame into the bottom size and top size properties of the crop effect. After that, move the playhead to the desired end frame of the animation, which in this example is the last frame of the second clip. Then change the bottom size and top size values accordingly. Please also remember to set the interpolation mode to your preference to get a smooth animation. Okay, to finish off this video editing project, I'll add some music to this video. So I'll drag the audio file to track 1, and then show its waveform. Then I'll trim off the start of the audio clip such that it matches the video scenes on track 2. As for the extra audio beyond the video track, I will trim it off starting at 0.5 second after the end of the video clip. I'll make this music the foreground music of the driving scene, and then bring it to the background as the video enters the second scene, by reducing its volume. In addition to that, I will also add fade in and out effects to the start and to the end of this audio clip. To do all these, we'll have to manually animate the volume property, just like adding the zooming in and zooming out animations we did earlier. So first, to add the fade-in effect, with the audio clip is being selected, move the playhead to the start of the audio clip, and then set the volume property to zero. Then I'll move the playhead to the one second mark of the timeline, and set the volume to one. Next, to bring the music to the background as it enters the second clip, first move the playhead to roughly the middle of the transition, and then insert a keyframe into the volume property. After that, Move the playhead 1.5 second to the right, and then set the volume to 0.5. And to add a fade out effect, move the playhead to the start of the shutter closing effect, and then insert keyframe to the volume property. And finally, move the playhead to the end of the audio clip, and then set the volume to zero.
To make the foreground music clear over the driving scene, I will mute the audio component of the first video clip. One way to do it is to right-click the clip, select Volume, and then select Entire Clip, and then click Level 0%. And as final touch-up, I will also add a fade-in and a fade-out effect to the audio component of the second video clip. Alright, now let's play the video from the beginning to see the final result. Alright, so once you finish editing the project and are happy with the result, you can export the project to your preferred video format. To do that, click the Export Video button on the toolbar. On the Export Video dialog, type in the desired file name and the destination folder. On the Simple tab, under Profile, select the desired format. If you are going to upload the video to the internet, you should select Web. Then under Target, select the preferred target. For this example, I'll set it to YouTube standard. As for the profile, you may choose your preferred profile or use the suggested one. And lastly, but most importantly, you should select a video quality level that will give you the balance between video quality and video file size. The higher the video quality, the larger the video file size will be. And to refine this video quality setting further, click the advanced tab and then click video settings. Under the bitrate setting, Set the desired bit rate that will give you the best balance between quality and file size. You can re-export the project with different bit rates to see the difference. Once all set, click Export Video. This process may take a while, depending on your video's length and quality. Alright, so that's about it for this OpenShot tutorial for the absolute beginners. I hope you find it useful, and thank you for watching.